Okay, thanks. This is a hands-on workshop. So I, I've been giving out some stickers. If anyone doesn't have any, there's some more on the table over there. There's a URL on the back of them. So we're going to go through um, this particular app. We're actually going to do a, an end-to-end -end workflow from training a model to serving it to having a client make calls on the model. Okay, so uh, I'm with Logical Clocks, and uh, I'm going to talk about our platform that supports TensorFlow. I'm going to do an example, which is hot dog or not. And this is the URL that's on the back of your stickers. So if you want to know while you're talking, you can just register an email address. It doesn't even have to be a valid email address if you don't want to. Um, there's some people in Stockholm who should validate these while I'm talking here. Um, and then you should be able to, so you will need to have in your password a, an uppercase letter, so capitals and a, and a number. So just remember that. And you do have to, unfortunately, put in a, what's your favorite pet? Uh, or your, your, your mother's maiden name. All right, just a, a, a couple of words about our platform. Our platform is called Hops. It's the world's fastest Hadoop platform. It's the only Hadoop distribution that supports GPUs in the cloud. And we did some work with Spotify and Oracle, where we got 16 times the throughput of Hadoop. Um, but I'm not going to talk about that. So I'm going to talk, we're going to work with this platform. This is the Hops data platform. Uh, we call it Hops Works. Um, and what it is, is it's a user interface. And you have access to all of these different open source services behind that user interface. And the user interface also is a REST API. So if you want to use the platform programmatically, you can do it. Uh, this little shield thing up there means we're, we're basically built on TLS certificates, not on Kerberos, so you can integrate with this externally with your IoT apps or um, anything else outside of this. And uh, it'll integrate still with Active Directory if you're, if you're running in a Kerberos kind of environment. So for the, who, who here is a data scientist who actually writes Python? All right, I, I normally talk to data scientists, okay? So, uh, so this is um, slightly, off track. So all of you will probably know Spark, and, and you're familiar with Flink and things like that, which we have in the platform. But when you get into data science, you typically will use a lot of Python. Right? So Python has become pretty much the de facto language for data science. We have R, but if you're going to do deep learning, and today we're going to look at deep learning, Python is, is the, the name of the game. And if you're going to do deep learning on Python, there's a number of frameworks. And you can see there's a big TF there for TensorFlow. That's pretty much the dominant platform. You also have Keras, which is an API on top of TensorFlow. It's extremely popular. And then this little droplet there represents something called PyTorch, which is getting quite a lot of attra uh, traction in the research community. Um, but what our platform basically does is it, it, it's, a, it's you can think of it as being like a Hadoop distribution. It'll run on the cloud or on-prem. But you can write in Jupyter. That's what we're going to do today. We're going to write a notebook in Jupyter. And we're going to run it. And it'll run on, on, hop, on Yarn, actually, Hops Yarn. And um, you can also write Spark applications, use Kafka. And then we use a lot of other services like Influx, Grafana, Elastic, and Kibana for, for monitoring applications and giving feedback. But it is a kind of Hadoop distribution, so you still have Hive. One feature that's currently under development, and it's not in the version we look at today, is we're using Kubernetes for uh, scale-out model serving. So we will do model serving, but it won't be elastic today. OK, so who's heard of Kubeflow? No? One, two, two. OK, so at this point with data scientists, they'll say, well, you should be doing Kubeflow. What's the story? So Kubeflow is a recent framework that Google released for doing machine learning on Kubernetes. And if you're a data scientist, you'll have to write your YAML file defining your structure, your infrastructure. So you'll say, I need these uh, containers. I'd like a container with this label that has GPU and, um, and so on. And with your infrastructure, you need to then define a Docker file because you want to install libraries. You want to have Python libraries in there. Um, and you, you basically write a Docker file. And then finally, you'll have a Jupyter Notebook, and off you can go and do your machine learning. So, Hops is a, an alternative model to this. Um, what we're trying to do is make it easier to use than um, Kubeflow. And I'll, I'll show you why in a, in a minute. So what we introduce in Hops is we introduce some abstractions that we, we think it helps make it easier to do machine learning. So the main one is something called a project. So everyone is familiar with GitHub. 
So you know, on GitHub, you have a project or a repository. And in your repo, you can add members. And you can give them roles inside that repo. So we have the same abstraction. And we, we think this is the right way for machine learning people to work. You have data engineers and data scientists in the same projects. And they take hand of machine learning pipelines from end to end. So data scientists aren't expected to do everything by themselves. And data engineers aren't expected to do all the data science. They work together as a team. Now, the, the project abstraction is, is security by design. So we have certificates behind it. Um, it's very self-service. It's designed for ease of use. So you'll see that everything is basically point and click for data scientists. And at the back end, it's scale out deep learning. So because we have GPUs in our cluster here, you can run the jobs that we're going to look at today on one GPU, on 10 GPUs, on 50 GPUs, 100 GPUs. And then the question is, well, why would I care about many GPUs? Well, we want to do parallel experiments. If you're, I'll talk about this in a bit. But parallel experiments is when you start doing some data science and you want to maybe build a model architecture for your deep learning system, you don't just write the code once and run it. I mean, nobody has ever written code once and compiled it and it worked and was fine. You iteratively improve it. So you may change the hyperparameters. You may run some small experiments to see if this converges better. And these parallel experiments, you can actually run many of them in parallel. There's no reason why, if you have one GPU, you have to sit there and wait for each experiment to finish before you start a new one. If you have like 50 GPUs, you just run 50 in parallel. And then the second reason why scale-out deep learning is important is because if you have a large data set and you're training, it can be very compute intensive and can take a long time. So there's well-known data sets like ImageNet with a million images. And we work with some vehicle manufacturers, and they have millions of images. And if you train them on a single GPU, you're looking at weeks. And that's not a uh, good use of your data scientist's time if you're paying them you know, relatively high salaries. So distributed training will enable you to train your models much faster on larger volumes of data. OK, the next reason I, I, why I think it's interesting is that we have, this is why, why it's easier to use um, hops, is that we have persistent Python in the cluster. So remember, we have a GitHub project, this project abstraction. And inside your project, you have your own Conda environment. And that Conda environment will live on every machine in the cluster. So when you want to install something into your project, a Python library, you're installing it just for your project, not for anyone else's. So each project can have its own version of Python. It can have its own version of every libraries. And uh, we think it's pretty easy uh, for data scientists to use this. And why all this can come together and work well in an enterprise environment? Well, we don't use Kerberos. We use certificates. So certificates are the the main mechanism we have to enable multi-tenancy in this platform, to have many different projects coexist on the same platform and still be protected from one another. So we have, for when you're a member of a project, you'll have a certificate created for every member of a project. We call those per project user certificates. Um, so if you think about how you have two projects, like project A and project B, I can't copy data from project A to project B because I have a different user identity in project A than I have in project B. So there's a different certificate for each user. And a user A may have you know, access rights for some data set, and user B doesn't. So user B can't read from that data set. So it's not enough just to have certificates uh, identifying and authorizing users. You also need to have certificates for the services, things like the name node, resource manager, Kafka brokers, Hive server, et cetera. Um, another thing we have that's, this is, if you're familiar with Google, this is, this is basically the same as Google's internal security architecture for Google Cloud. Uh, every application you run will generate a new certificate for that. And the advantage of that is then we can track what particular files users have read and written. And we can save that and make that available for auditing. OK, so then the, the, we, the platform is completely open source, but we are a company, and we do have a, you know, a, a, a enterprise version that supports certificate revocation, renewal, and reloading. Um, OK, so um, GPU in Yarn. So we have support for GPUs in Yarn as an explicit resource. You can basically say, give me 10 GPUs on this host, 4 GPUs on this host. You can use node labeling in Yarn to say, give me 
GPUs only on hosts that have InfiniBand support. And the, the actual GPUs, we only support NVIDIA for now. So those of you who are familiar with GPUs know that NVIDIA are the dominant player in deep learning right now, so it's CUDA. But you can have a mix of different types of NVIDIA GPUs. So you may buy the commodity 1080 Ti's, and you may buy the P100's or V100's. So you can run all of them in the, in the same cluster, and it works OK. Obviously, if you're going to train, you would, and you, you don't want to have a mix. If, you're, if you have half of your GPUs are very high-end ones and half are low-end, that may affect your training time, because the, the slow ones may slow down the, the faster ones. So when you're training, you should use things like node labeling to make sure that um, you're training them on the GPUs you want to, to train them on. OK, I'm going to actually, at this point, I feel I'm talking quite a lot. So has, has, have people managed to log in, create accounts and logged in? One or two, someone shaking their head. I will, I'll, I will. It's on these stickers that we have, or they're going around here. But it's, the URL is hops.io slash tf. Hops.io slash tf. So if you type that in, so you can register any email address. Just remember, your, you just try a new email address with a new password and uh, just remember it, and then try and use that to log in in about a minute. OK, so I'm going to go over. This is where you get to when you, you do that. This is kind of the basic instructions for the, the workshop. So if you click on this hops here link, you come to actual uh, hops. If you're curious, this is basically running on a, on a large uh, VM in Google, Google Cloud. And um, so if I go back, I'll just open up the other one, actually, hops.io.tf. OK, so what, what, what I'm going to go through today, I'm going to go through a bit more background just before we, we, we get started. Um, but what I'm going to go through today is we're going to do a, a TensorFlow tour, an end-to-end -end machine lear learning workload. And you're basically going to create a, a project called TensorFlow Demo. And in that project, you can train and export a model. I think it's quite hard to read that text from down here. So we're going to train and export a model. This will basically use the, the hello world of deep learning called MNIST. Many of you will be bored with this, but many of you may be new for you as well. So when that model is trained, it will be a file, a protocol buffer file. And that file will live in our distributed file system, HDFS. And then we'll start a TensorFlow model server, number B. And from that, we can then load the, the, the protocol buffers file and serve it. And if you're familiar with TensorFlow serving, you'll know that this will be using gRPC as an API. And then we can, what we need to do is basically copy the IP and port from our serve model and paste that into another notebook called the serving client. And with that, it, we can then run the client. And it will, um, it will then send gRPC requests to the model server. And it will classify the images that it sends. And uh, it will get back responses. So if you're not familiar with MNIST, I'll, t I'll give you a, a 10 second description of it. MNIST is Hello World for Deep Learning. It's, um, it's a data set with tens of thousands of hand-drawn numbers. You have the numbers from 0, 1, 2, 3, all the way up to 9. There's 10 of them. So what you do is you train. The, the images that come in are very small. They're 28 by 28 pixels, and they're grayscale. So you're basically turning them into a big vector. It's 768 elements, 28 by 28 long. And you basically feed that into the neural network. So the neural network can be a, a convolutional neural network, a feed forward. It's quite easy to train a good prediction model on MNIST. And once you've trained it, you'll get out the network itself. Will be, you can save it as a protocol buffers file. So once you've got this trained model, I can take any different 28 by 28 pixel image with a number, a hand-drawn number on it, send it to the train model and say, tell me what number this is. Is this a 2? Is it a 4? Is it an 8? OK, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll give you a quick look at this before we actually, because you're kind of hot dog or not, let's have a quick look at it before we, we go in and, and start doing the other practical work. So this is the hot dog or not um, uh, notebook. And what it basically does is I took a data set that I found on a Kaggle competition. And I took a, a, 
a notebook by this guy, Magnus Peterson. He does really good tutorials, much better than the, the official uh, TensorFlow tutorials. And, his, and this is actually, this is a, a, I would say it's a sophisticated notebook at some level. What it does is it takes the raw images. Now, we've, I've already cropped the images to 200 by 200 in size, and there's another notebook for that. But um, with those raw images, we're going to turn them into what we call TensorFlow records. Has anyone heard of TensorFlow records? Yeah, a couple of people. So TensorFlow records are, are the native file format for training TensorFlow models. And the reason why you want to use TensorFlow records is because if you have GPUs and, you're, and we decide, well, I'm going to read the files, I'm going to decode the images, I'm now going to convert them into my you know, 20 by 20 pixel or 20 by 20 array. As, there's three color channels here, so it's 20 by 20 by 3. That's actually quite compute intensive, and it will slow down training. So your GPUs will be waiting a lot of the time for data to come in. So you know, if you have 10 GPUs on a server and you have 20 CPUs, those CPUs probably can't decode those images fast enough and fetch them uh, to feed those GPUs and keep them busy. So in a production pipeline, you should be doing your feature engineering and data wrangling in something like Spark, if it's large data. It can be just TensorFlow. But then if you save your output in, product, in TensorFlow records, then you can make sure that you use those to, f to train the models directly. So this notebook, just a, a brief overview of it, it basically, it, it, we, you can see that we're going to have to import the images from a shared data set. And that's doing it there. And there's some images. And then we're, um, in this case, defining it as a data set. So we're using a data set API in, in TensorFlow. And um, then we have some images here. It's not a huge data set. It's only 1,000 images. And we can plot a few of those images you can see here. Uh, this is a hot dog true, and this is labeled. These are all labeled true as hot dogs, actually. And then we convert them here into TensorFlow records. And once we have our TensorFlow records, we can then um, store them in HDFS. And then finally, we'll define a parse function that our data set API will use to, to feed uh, TensorFlow. And then we have another input function, which will pull the records out of that. And then finally, we're training it down here. So OK, first we have to define our features, but then we, we do our training down here. And we're doing it on a very simple pre canned estimator. This is the estimator framework in TensorFlow. Um, if you're familiar with Spark, you, you, you may have seen the, data flow or the Spark Summit last week. Ten, um, data, Databricks just released uh, a framework that looks exactly like this, an estimator framework for doing deep learning uh, from Spark. But this is the one that's native to uh, TensorFlow. OK, so once you've trained your model, you can see you can get your prediction accuracy. Um, on this canned estimator, I'm not getting great values. And then we have some predictions and so on. So you know, if you want to take a picture of a hot dog while you're here and add it to the data set, feel free to do that. You know, It should work. Um, but let's go back and see. That's where we're going to get to. Um, by the end of this. At this point, do we have questions? Feel free to play around if you're in there. Um, start on the tour and do a TensorFlow tour and, 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 and go ahead. OK. Right, a little bit of background then, a little bit more theory. So why, is, wh wh why, do, why do we think distributed TensorFlow is interesting. Why, why, why do we want to actually use lots of GPUs to, to you know, make our models go train faster or, or do f more experimentation in parallel on them? Well, you can do it quite easily in, in, in Spark, actually. We use Spark as the framework to do data parallel uh, training and, and data parallel experiments. So if you imagine a setup where you, like this one where you have 100 GPUs, we have 100 GPUs all connected to our distributed file system, HDFS. What we do when we're training deep learning models is we, we, we do what's called an iteration. An iteration is when you take a batch. In this case, it will be files corresponding to each image, or TensorFlow records, which we're actually going to use. So let's say we have a batch of 3,200 TensorFlow records. Well, we want 32 of them to go into one GPU, 32 into the next. And each GPU will get 32 of these records. They would then do what we call a forward pass in, uh, in deep learning. And then it would calculate the changes in the weights in our network. We call those the gradients. And each GPU will do it for their 32 
samples in this batch, and they'll send their gradients up somewhere. You can think of this abstractly, because what we'll see later on is the parameter server that you think you should send these to is actually not the scalable model we'll be using in a few years. We'll be using a ring. So in the traditional parameter server model, you would send them all up to a server who would aggregate all of these gradients, compute a new model, so the changes in weights from all of these 100 GPUs, add them all together, change the weights, and send this new updated model down to all the GPUs. That is one iteration. Now, if you imagine that you have 30, um, let's say you have 3,200,000 uh, uh, samples, well, then we're going to do an, a thousand of those iterations to cover all of the 3.2 million samples. So once you've done all thousand iterations, we call that an epoch. And typically, training models requires tens of epochs, you know, 10, 20, 30, 50. So you can see that this is, this is a, a cycle that's going to go round and round and round. Now, everyone here, I guess, is familiar with Spark at some level. So you can imagine pretty much how this is going to work in Spark. Our GPUs will basically have an executor each in them. And we're going to have to have some way of kicking off the, the training from the driver. So this is kind of how we do the parallel experiments and hops in, in that style of architecture. Our Spark driver will start executors. The executors will have one GPU each. They'll have a full copy of the model on them. And then they'll communicate with each other by reading and writing to the file system. So, that's, so you know, if you're doing distributed uh, deep learning of any sorts, somehow the nodes need to communicate with each other. And um, Google also espoused the use of a, a distributed file system as the easiest way to do that. Because you need to do things like you need to collect the logs when you're training. Um, if we're doing parallel experiments, each of these executors will run a different full, full experiment. It's not the distributed training now. They're going to say, I'm going to run all of the training for this particular model with these hyperparameters on this input data. And they're going to write the output to the file system. And all the executors will do that, and they'll write all their outputs to the file system. We'd like to be able to visualize that at the end with TensorBoard. You know, we'd like to be easily able to get our model service to pull out the, the trained models. We'd like to be able to checkpoint our models and, and have easy access to them. So there's a lot of reasons for, for using a distributed file system um, when you're building these systems. OK, let's have a look at the, the, the pipeline. And we're, we'll, we'll have a look at, a, at an abstract pipeline and then we'll look at, at some examples that you can, you can play with while, while we're doing this. So the, the typical pipeline you'll have is that data will have to come in from somewhere. Now, if you're Uber, Uber has something called a feature store. And the feature store abstracts out whether it's coming from a Kafka topic or a Hive table uh, or just CSV files in, in HDFS or even S3. So, Many others will have to actually read from those sources directly. And you, know, you might decide, well, I'll use Spark for this and have data frames representing the different features that I want to combine together to train my model. But you still have to do all the work related to data wrangling, so transforming your data. In our case, we want to decode the images. We want to take th these hot dog images, and, and, and they're JPEGs. We need to decode them and turn them into vectors. Um, we want to maybe extract features from them. So we need to know, obviously, the labels of the images. Um, the next phase is quite a big box there. It's experimentation. So we then will need to play around with different networks and say, OK, what would be a good network for this? What would be good hyperparameters? And once you've decided what good hyperparameters and a good network is, then you can train the model. And then finally, you'd like to test it and serve it. Now, each of these boxes has way more detail than I can go into here. Um, things like serving, we've had a number of talks at this conference, very good ones as well, about some of the challenges of, of how to you know, handle serving. But um, I, I, I can't go into all the de detail on all of them, but if you have specific questions, we can, we can take them. So as a programmer, if you want to write this pipeline and you're a Python programmer, or your Python team, because we're going to have a team, remember, who are going to be responsible for this pipeline. You can, you can decide and, and use TensorFlow and Python the whole way if you want to. If your data is not that big, uh, it's completely feasible. Um, underneath it, what we provide as services to help you build these pipelines are things like Kafka, uh, Hive, HDFS, or we call it HopsFS. And then for serving, we have um, early support for Kubernetes. What we typically would espouse, though, would, is that people should use PySpark instead. 
uh, of TensorFlow, because obviously, as you know, PySpark can handle larger data volumes and can scale out. Um, but TensorFlow then becomes just a library that's run inside a larger PySpark job that we'll see later on. So again, you, you can run on the same infrastructure. So I'll do the first demo, and you can f try and follow with me. Is anybody not logged in, and, and you've got problems? Do you want to tell me wh why, or create a new, what you should do is create a new email address. No, you don't receive an email. You just try and log in. Sorry? You, sorry? You? Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Tell you what to do. You should, if you go back here, there's this update your Google spreadsheet. Just write your email address that you created. I have some guys on Slack, and I'll ask them to, uh, to just register the account. So if you just write in your email in the, this spreadsheet down here, anyone who has any problems, go to the hops.io slash tf. Mm hmm Okay. Um. Okay, so the, they, they should take care of this. So just update this right in your, um, and, they'll, and they'll fix that, hopefully, within a second. Okay, I'm going to log in, and um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, um, I think I'll log in here, actually. I have two accounts open. So for those of you who haven't logged in, so you, you just put in your email and password. There is support for two-factor authentication. There is, of course, HTTPS, but in this case, I just... Um, disabled it. So if you haven't run this tour, you can just click on the tour tips and enable that. It's quite annoying. You'll need to disable it later on because it just keeps popping up. And then click on TensorFlow. I've already done this. So um, I'm just going to go in and look at TensorFlow. So this is one, these are the projects here on the right-hand side that I mentioned before. And, and if I want to create a new project, um, let's call this one Stockholm. Oh, I can't spell Stockholm. OK. So creating a project is a relatively quick thing. You can see it takes a couple of seconds. And that project, so I, I, if I take my project here, the demo TensorFlow, if you feel friendly, you can talk to your neighbor and say, well, you know, maybe I'll add your, my neighbor to my project. So you can go in here, and I can add, in this case, I can add myself to the project, and I can add myself as one of two roles, data scientist or data owner. So if you talk to your neighbor, you can say, well, I'll add you, whatever. Um, and now what I'm going to do is I'm going to do the, this first uh, part of the pipeline, which is data collection, data transformation, and feature extraction. I'll just show you one, one feature that I think is quite nice, which is something called um, Google Facets. So what Google Facets is is a plug-in to, uh, to Jupyter. And it allows you to take any data set that you can read up in a Pandas data frame. And there's kind of a practical limit of about a gigabyte or two gigabytes um, for this. And it will then allow you to visualize uh, both the numerical and categorical features. You'll be able to see, see things like what columns have missing values used, what are the average values for columns. And uh, there's another one called Google Dive, which allows you to actually look at individual records or rows in your, in your uh, data frame. And you can then look at different distributions. So I'll do a quick look at that just to show you how it works. Um, let's go back here. So I'm going to start a Jupyter notebook for this. You can just press Start Jupyter, and it should just work. If you're curious, you can play around with this a bit. I've set the limit of the amount of memory to about five or something gigabytes. I don't remember. Um, number of parallel executions. I think it will limit it to two right now. And uh, this is, you can add jars and things and so on to your program if you want to, but I'm just going to run it. So the libraries that will be available to this notebook that I've just started um, will, be, will be visual. You can find them here in the Python 
Uh, this, these are microservices on the left hand side. So if I go into the Python one, I can see which libraries are installed. So these ones are available. So Pandas is already there. Facets is, is, a, is a plugin for Jupyter. It's already enabled. And TensorFlow is pre-installed. You can see as is um, hops and a uh, HDFS connector called PyDoop. So I'm going to go back to Jupyter. So if you get this far to Jupyter, um, if you want to try out facets, you just click on the facets folder. And you can try facets overview or facets dive. I will go with overview. And you can see it's going to start a normal Python kernel. So it's not running PySpark yet. This is just normal Python. And this will only work if you have Google Chrome. <laughs> if you're running Firefox, it won't work, I'm afraid. Uh, it's a Google product. What can I say? Um, but it's quite nice if you have Google Chrome. So I'll just explain what this code is doing, just so you can see it. It's basically taking a number of features defined in a list here. So we have these are the features that are defined in a data set called the census data from, U, from the US. And it's reading it from HDFS. So it's going to take the path to your project. There's a, a folder in there called test job data census adult.data. It's a CSV file. And it's going to read that up into this pandas data frame train data. And we'll do the same thing with the pandas data frame test data. So if you're curious about that data, see this adult.data and adult.test, we can go back to Hopsworks. And I'm going to go back here to data sets. And we had this thing called test job here. So I'll click on that. And inside there, I'm going to follow this path, data, census, and then we have adult.test and adult.data. If you're curious, you can download it or you can preview it. And you can see some of the values there. Um, it'll only show you a small amount of the values. Um, but I'm just going to go back and uh, show you what we have in here in facets. So what we have here is um, we can see what we call numeric features. So if you have a, a pandas data frame, and it has, in this case, I think it has 11, if I'm not correct, if I'm not mistaken, 15, sorry, it has 15 features, you can see that Six of them are integers, and nine of them are strings. But data scientists don't like the terms integers and strings, so they call them numeric features. They don't like the term columns, so they call them features. Um, so what we would call a column of ints, they will call a numeric feature. And what we would call a column of strings, they'll call a categorical feature. Now, if, you're, if you know Python, who programs Python here a bit? Just ah, there's a few. OK. So if you're curious about, do I trust the values here? Uh, you can see I was just checking earlier on. I said, well, there's no missing columns here in the numeric features. But if we look in the categorical features, 5% of the work class uh, features have missing values. And countries have some missing values. So what I did earlier on was I basically um, I did the following. I just printed out which columns. I wanted to check which columns have null. And we can see that it says work class, occupation, and country have, have null values in there. So that seems to, to um, coincide with what we can see here in the, uh, in the visualization. Now, the, the point of this visualization is if you've done machine learning before and deep learning, you'll know that we have what's called training data and test data, or, or validation data. And you train on the training set. And when you're happy that you've trained, you then validate your training. See how accurate the model is you've trained on this holdout data that you haven't used before. But one of the thing, things you want to do when you, when you split your data into training and test data is you want to make sure that the data distribution that you're learning is the same in both the training data and the test data. Because if they're different, you'll train on one data distribution, and then you're going to try and validate it on a different distribution, then you won't get good results. So this is a tool which allows you to, you can see here um, that we can see some of the, the, the mean values, the max, the, the median. And then you can see some other uh, visualizations of this with histograms. So you get a pretty quick feeling of whether that's, uh, you're, that you're happy with your data. Now, if we go to Python Dive, it's, it's quite similar. You can run it as well if you have Google Chrome. And it's going to read the same uh, Pandas data frame, but it's going to read it into, a, um, into, into Facets Dive. So you can see it looks a bit different. If you click on any point here on the 
right-hand side, you can see the, it's going to show the row, the contents of that row. So what this particular, um, what's happening right now is that it's actually faceting the data by, we can do it by, this is education status, I think. Um, so you can, you, can, you can basically change how you would like to view the data. You can say, well, I'd like to view the data by, by education status or by age. And it will show you then the different distributions of people. So we can see most people in this data set are in these particular age brackets. Um, and then you, if you think one of the data points is a little bit off, like this one at the top, we can get one up here. We can see this one has an age of 90 and then some more details about them. Okay, so this is what we call feature engineering. Um, I'm going to shut down this notebook. Hang on. And the way you shut it down when you come out here is you can just press this button here, which will shut down uh, your Jupyter Notebook for you. I didn't actually close it here, so we close that. Does anyone have issues that aren't being handled right now? Or you can write them into the, to the, to the um, spreadsheet. Any questions on facets? No? Easy enough. Right, so let's move ahead. Yeah. So if you're a Python person, I just wanted to impress on you that the fact that your data is in HDFS just means that you get this one different line of code change. Um, sorry, we go back here. This. Right, so it's not a big deal. So the fact here, many Python frameworks like TensorFlow, Pandas, PySpark, they support HDFS natively, which we do too. OK, so the next part of our pipeline, and the pipeline's up on the top right-hand side if you want to know where we are, is we're still in the data prep, the, the, you know, the data wrangling phase. And TensorFlow, since 1.4, I believe, in core, they introduced the TF Data API. It's a new data set API. And in it, you can, do, you can put in map functions. To, to, you can pre-process your data in pipelines in TensorFlow. The only problem with it is that it's a bit of a mess, right? So if you like nice, clean, Pythonic code, this is not the code for you, right? If you want to write a for loop, you don't write a for loop. And this is one of the reasons why, for example, PyTorch is gaining adoption, because it's very Pythonic. Um, but there's no need to have to worry much about this. This will only run on a single server. You need to care about things like how many threads are used for pre-batching, how many parallel batches are used, if you want this thing to work efficiently. Um, but just uh, our, our advice would be forget about it. Use PySpark and output your data as TF records. Right? Because this will be efficient. It will scale with the number of executors. And then when your data is out, you, you will have a, another job to orchestrate these different parts of your pipeline. In our case, we use Spark to orchestrate the different jobs. But maybe different people uh, in different frameworks will use other, other tools. So this is what the code looks like in, in PySpark for taking, for example, images and resizing them and cropping them, because that's what we want to do with our hot dog uh, images. I've done this already, by the way. Uh, you can see the code is very clean, right? You're basically reading images. The path can be in HDFS. Here's a really nice feature, this sample ratio. So if you're in the experimentation phase and you have 300 gigabytes of data, you don't necessarily want to read up 300 gigabytes of data into a data frame. You might want to read up just you know, 300 megabytes, and then your sample ratio is 0 .0, uh, 0.01. And once you've got your data up in a data frame, you can now apply a transformer. This is using something called MML Spark from Microsoft. It's a, an open source library they have for machine learning on Spark. And they have a transformer for, for uh, ma manipulating images. And image support is now in Spark 2.3. And then uh, Yahoo have a framework called TensorFlow on Spark. And they have some libraries for taking data frames and exporting them as TF records. So that's, that's how you basically get to the point where you're now ready to play with your models in TensorFlow. And this is where I get back to the distribution issue that when you're training a deep learning model, you think, well, it's a loop, a training loop. But there, that's the inner loop. right? The outer loop is when you actually need to look for things like a good model architecture, a good set of hyperparameters. And no matter what way it cuts, that takes a lot of time and a lot of experimentation. And you can, we think you can cut that down massively with distrib uh, distribution 
running them in parallel. So we look at a little way of doing that in, in hops. If you're curious and want to follow along and, and do this, you can, I'm going to jump to the code. This is hyperparameter optimization in hops. There's a notebook for this. So if we go back here and start Jupyter, this one is going to take a bit more time because you're going to do quite a lot of training. So if you go to TensorFlow and CNN, and we have two of them here. One is called hyperparameter search on CIFAR 10. That will take half the evening, so I would, we'll kind of skip that. I'll look at grid search on Fashion MNIST. So Fashion MNIST came from, from Berlin, actually. It's a, it's a data set to replace the classic MNIST with 10 different images of clothing, 10 different classes of, of clothing. And it was released by, uh, by these guys, I think. Um, at, um, what's the name of your company again? <laughs> My brain's gone dead. Zalando, yeah, Zalando released this data set. Thank you. You saved me. Okay, so I, I'm going to run this, but what, like, so what happened when I run this, I didn't, I didn't go into any details. You can pick a number of executors that you want to run in parallel. If you have, I'll just show you wh wh what happens when you run it. In this case, you just define a dict with the combinations of learning rate and dropout rate. These are hyperparameters in the deep learning model. In this case, it will run six different Spark executors. Each of them will run just one experiment. The first one will have a learning rate of 0, 0, 001. The second one will have a dropout rate of 0 0.5, and then and so on. The second one will have a, learn, a learning rate of 0, 0, 005, and a dropout rate of 0, 005. So when all that's run, we'll get the results in, in, a, in a nice um, uh, tensor board that we can visualize. And uh, it kind of looks like this. You'll see your learning rates here, and then you can look up here to find out the best combination of learning rates. Um, but there's another thing that I said don't press the button on, because this is very compute intensive. It's a new area of, re well, of not just research, but development, which is can the best computers find better models than the best machine learning experts? And the answer is yes. It's a resounding yes. So Google, um, this year and last year, they released a, two different frameworks, one on reinforcement learning and another one on genetic algorithms. And they improved the state of the art for training image classification on a well-known data set called ImageNet. So they beat the best results gotten by humans by having computer programs, reinforcement learning agents, and genetic algorithms search for a better model architecture. So, you know, a, a good, you know, the people in, that you hear talk, talk in the valley that, you know, a good data scientist can get a million dollars. Well, if the good data scientist is just picking good combinations of hyperparameters and designing good models in terms of which layers it should have and how many it should have, if the computer can do that by basically searching using many GPUs in parallel, well, I don't know which will be cheaper in a few years. Make hay while the sun shines, is what we say. OK, so this, this particular example, we, we have genetic algorithms in hops. We have something called evolutionary search. Um, this is, uh, it, it will basically run for 10 generations. It's doing genetic algorithms. And you can specify mutation rates and, and crossover rates and how many executors, your population size, the number of executors in Spark you're going to have. And then it will search using different combinations of those hyperparameters. OK, so this is showing you just how it runs, because it takes a little bit of time. So the first run, CIFAR 10 has 10 different image classes. So if you do random, uh, if you train a random model, you'll get a 10% chance of being right. So this is 10% chance of being right. But after one generation, you can see that we get some improvement. And genetic algorithms will pick out the best ones, and it will generate mutations from the best ones. So within one more generation, we get a, a quite a large improvement in the model accuracy. And then you know, we, we get even more improvement. So uh, you know, you're going to have, at some point, you're going to have diminishing returns on this. Um, but it's a good way of, it's a promising new way. It's auto, auto ML, it's called, of having computers design uh, the best models for your, for your architecture. OK, so that's the experiment phase. Um, let's go back and, and see how this thing was going. Right, so I started this running earlier on, didn't I? The grid search. So you can see it's, it's, you've still got a star going on here. 
Is anyone running this? No one. Okay. Right. So I'll just show you um, when it's running if you want to look at, at, at how it's proceeding. Here, and you can just start it running now and, and have a look at it. What will happen is this button will appear here. It says a Spark UI um, for your session. So if you press that button, you can actually get to the Spark UI. We can look at how many executors are running. I think I only had one executor, but maybe I had two. Yeah, I've only one executor and a driver. So it's only going to run one experiment at a time. But you can have six, you know, if you had six executors, then they'll run six in, in parallel. And you can look at the tensor board while it's training. When this, image, when this run finishes, the tensor board will disappear. So it only appears for a little bit. And you can see that, you know, it's, it's getting quite good accuracy. It's up to 83%. And if you want to look at logs, uh, this is a, an issue that you have in Yarn. So if you're working in, in a Yarn environment, you'll know that logs are only aggregated when, when the job completes, which is no good. So if you click on the Kibana button, you get your logs in real time. And you know, if you want, you can even do graphing based on your logs. And then we have some um, metrics for the job in, uh, coming in in Grafana here. And then there's also the Yarn UI if you're interested in that. For that, so you can you can basically, we go back here. You can basically track the progress of your jobs, not just in here in the notebook, but also using this um, these set of UIs here. And you can break them out into a new window if you want to. Okay. Anyone? Any questions or points? We're not very interactive at this point. OK. So what I suggest is, who, who has run something? Right? Who's run uh, any TensorFlow notebook? One, a few over here. OK. So let, let's everyone try and who, who, who's in here, let's try and just do the first part, which was serving a model and then having a client run on that mo uh, trained model. So yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, Moon is my friend, but I, I, I would say because Zeppelin is not so good. <laughs> um, Jupiter, the, the development effort that's gone into making Jupiter better in the big data space in the last two years has been huge. So we're using something called Spark Kernel here for Jupiter, which is quite nice, and you obviously have the Python kernels. Um, Zeppelin, uh, we haven't, and, we, and, and we, we wrote a connector for Jupyter to put the notebooks in, in HDFS. So anybody logs in from any server anywhere, they'll see the same view of all the notebooks. Um, the problem with Zeppelin is that it, we've had stability issues with it and um, isolation. So it's, it's designed to have people uh, be able to collaborate on the same notebook, but in practice, we don't find that it works that well. So we have we're, we, we're lim we've limited we have support for Zeppelin, but it's really we're encouraging people to use things like Hive and, and, and looking at SQL in there rather than writing Spark jobs. Um, so we're moving more over to Jupiter. Okay, let, let's do the model serving thing because I have one running already. I'll just stop that one and we'll do a new one. Okay, so I'm going to start Jupyter Notebook, and we go back here. So anybody wants to follow along, just go into your demo TensorFlow. Tour, start your Jupyter Notebook. Um, I notice I killed my grid search one there. Oops, let me go back and kill this. I'm going to open it again. You can click this button to open it again. So I, if you click on the serving, this is in, in the instructions, actually. So in the instructions that we had at the beginning, which were here, um, we're going to follow these first instructions. So you can follow along here. You're basically going to start a Jupyter Notebook, and we're going to run this serving train and export model notebook. So I'll go back here, and we go to serving. And I'm going to open this train and export model notebook. So if I run this, this is not a Spark notebook. This is a Python notebook. You can see that we're kind of moving between Spark and Python notebooks quite quickly. Uh, oh, I'm getting an error because I think the model's already there. So I have to put in a different directory. So, um, so I've already trained this. So let's go back out. So this will work fine for you. I, need to, I would need to delete that, but I'm just going to skip the deleting part. Um, leave. 
And then once you've run that, that, takes, that goes very quickly. I'll delete this one here. Um, then, you can, then you'll come into this particular page here, the model serving page. So you can just click on this button here, create model serving. And from here, you can then select the model that you trained. So the models will be in this data set called models. And the one we trained is called MNIST. We can click on that. And there we go. So I now need to still press the Create Saving button. And you can enable batching for it to, make it, for it to improve throughput at the cost of latency. And then just press Run. That's it. And then your notebook, your um, TensorFlow serving server will start serving that model. And you can see the port and host IP address that it's, start, it's running on. Has anyone gotten anywhere with that? We're trying. OK. Let's, let's go back, and now we'll, we'll do the client. And we'll see how we do the client. So I've copied the port from, from this particular page here. I copied that port that the server's listening on. And now I'm going to paste it in here on line 21, where has the server IP and port down here. So if I just run this, what it's going to do is, this is a Python program, and you can see it's importing NumPy, which we have already. It's using TensorFlow. We've got HDFS, because we're going to read some images from HDFS. It's basically a gRPC application. It's a gRPC client, and it's a bit messy, to be honest. Right? There's, you know, you've quite a bit of work to set up your client. So the good news is that uh, the other bad news is that it only works with Python 2.7. So if you enabled a, a project with Python 3.6, this won't work. But the good news from yesterday is that um, TensorFlow Serving 1.8 was released, and that supports uh, a REST API. So now it'll be much easier to use that. So here we go. The client ran. It, it ran a bunch of images. It sent them to the TensorFlow server. It was going to classify them. And we can see it got an accuracy of 93%. OK, so <coughs> that was the MNIST model that we sent some images to. And it said, you know, I think this is a 2. And 93% of the time, it was correct. And this will handle, you know, it's pretty efficient um, model server, TensorFlow Serving. It can handle hundreds of requests per second. And you can leave these running. And you can monitor your logs. But obviously, you want to have more hooks in here. And we have a REST API to this. So you can get at this data if you want to, for example, uh, do some retraining of your model. So I'm going to go back to the slides, because um, <clears throat> I didn't talk about distributed training, but we'll, we'll, get, we'll, we'll have a quick look at that now. So I mentioned earlier that you know, we're, we're working with some people, and they have a million images of, of self-driving vehicle situations. And if you want to train a model on, on those million images, you know, many people will say, use transfer learning. Take a, a trained model and then do this on top of it. But you know, if you want to be the best in your industry and have the best prediction models, you, you will not do that. You'll train from scratch, because you'll get better results. So the problem is, on a single GPU, this inner loop of training, it can take weeks for that kind of data set. So you want to get weeks down to minutes. And that's kind of where the Facebooks and Google of this world are. So they, they, the ImageNet data set, which takes two weeks on a large GPU to train, Google recently got a training time down to 18 minutes uh, on 256 uh, TPU v2s. Facebook had one hour on the P100s last year. They're actually kind of competing with each other to see who can do the best, uh, have the you know, quickest training time. So the problem with distributed training is that if you do it, for example, in a multi-tenant cloud environment, um, you get all of the problems of you know, network I.O. from other jobs causing your training job to slow down. So the Facebooks and Googles do these on dedicated networks. Um, I, network I.O. becomes one of the main bottlenecks. Now, I mentioned earlier that the parameter server model is not uh, the future. and It's not what people are using to get high-performance distributed training. The model that people are using is what we call ring all reduce. It's, a, it's an algorithm from high performance computing. And because we're network I.O. bound here, what happens with the f uh, with, we can see what's happening in the ring reduce algorithm. It's just sending all the gradients between all the nodes. So they're using both the upload and download bandwidth of all of the nodes efficiently. 
in the parameter server model, the GPU servers are basically just sending their data up and getting some down. They're not necessarily using all their available bandwidth, and they're doing it quite synchronously. So what we'll see is some, there are, is some optimizations in the ring reduce algorithm that when you're computing gradients on the backwards pass through the layers, you can send those gradients on a per layer basis while you're computing the gradients for the next layer. So you don't need to just wait till you get to the bottom and send all the gradients. You can do it as you progress down through your network. And if you have a ResNet 101 or ResNet 150 with 150 layers, there's a lot of opportunities for overlapping I.O. and compute there. So network bandwidth is the bottleneck for distributed training. Um, this is me playing up to cliches. Uh, the parameter server is a bottleneck, and the, the gradients flow freely, like the Guinness on the, uh, the ring all reduce model. Now, we've done some experiments on some of our GPU servers. This is two GPU servers with 10 GPUs each. They're 1080 TIs. We, this is the cheap-ass infrastructure that if you want to build it on-prem, this is what you do. Um, we bought InfiniBand 40 gigabit cards. There were, I think, seven of them for 700 euros with the switch. And the, the cards themselves cost um, 700 euros, I think now is the current price. But we got extremely good performance. I mean, we're getting about, I think we're getting 1,100 images for 10 GPUs and about 1,800 images per second. This is with ResNet training. This one here is Inception, but we get similar results for ResNet. Um, and this is on the ImageNet data set. So what was interesting with that was uh, I was at a talk recently by a large corporation who on their cloud on InfiniBand said, well, we got 1,800 images per second on 64 uh, high-end NVIDIA cards, V100s. And we were getting the same on 20 1080 Ti's, which are the commodity cards. So the reason why we're getting good results here is that you can see the network is, this is over 10 gigabit per second for training between all the nodes, but the GPU utilization is, is extremely high. Now, if you look at the parameter server model, this is what it looks like. It's a bit of a mess. GPU utilization goes up and down as nodes are waiting for the model to come back from the parameter servers and network bandwidth is only used sporadically. So then the, if you're convinced that distributed training is the way to go and you'd like to do it, what does the code look like? Well, ten, uh, Horovod is a, is a layer that you write TensorFlow code inside of. And you basically just have a couple of primitives to work with. You have this HVD object. Um, it, it, it allows you to wrap your optimizer so that the gradients get sent between all the GPUs. You can use some MPI primitives like local rank, number of nodes in the system, H or size, hvd.size. And you know, in rank zero, you might say, well, I'm going to checkpoint my models in the, in the GPU at rank zero. And then in the other ones, I'll do whatever. So this will just be boilerplate TensorFlow code that you're, you're putting in here. And if you go with the distributed TensorFlow model, you'll find the code is quite complex. Um, it's a bit messy. So the API that we have has a, has a good bit more than, than just the, um, the things we've seen so far. Um, there's support for Kafka and Spark and Flink. Um, and we've seen some of the support for things like TensorBoard and, and HDFS. So I, I showed already this example, the model serving example. Um, but what I didn't talk about was, well, you know, once you're serving your model, what do I do now? Right? How does the loop get closed? We start by uh, ingesting data you know, we go all the way to experimentation, training, and, and, and serving models. Um, but then you need to monitor your models in production. So you need to look at the difference, for example, between your performance, your prediction performance when you're training versus when you're actually serving. So you need to maintain statistics. So if a prediction comes in, you need to then say, well, this prediction was made for this input data, and this was the actual results. And we save that data, and we can then use that to compare it with what we trained on and say, well, there's some skews happening here, some training serving skews happening. It's now time to start a new round of training. We need to train a new model on because we have new data, training data available. And uh, you know, we call this covariant shift uh, as the method that you would use to, to signify when you, when you want to do training. Now, there may be other reasons why you want to retrain your models. Maybe you know, some event has happened that you know about that affects the models. Maybe you just want to do it periodically. Um, but you need to have the tools to do that. So in our case, you can use the REST API and the data stored in HDFS to, to decide on when to train. 
Now, let's go back and let's, um, let's look at this, this actual practical part. So we kind of did the first part, which was the tour, and we did our end-to-end -end pipeline for, for MNIST. <laughs> let's have a look now at the hot dog example. Unless anyone has any questions. No? Okay. I'll aim to finish a couple of minutes early as well so that we can enjoy the fine weather and fine cuisine of uh, Berlin. Okay, so let's go to this Python uh, notebook for hot dogs. So what you actually have to do here is you have to right-click on it to download it. So I'm just going to save it. Um, I'll save it to this documents folder. So the, you know, I could have included this in your in your tour, but I just wanted to give you experience of of how easy it is to get data into the system. So if I want to create a new notebook, let's say I'm going to create a new notebook, we'll call it the uh, TFR. What I want to do is I want to upload that Python notebook that I downloaded into this project, but I also want to get the hot dog data set into the project. So I can start with one or the other, and this, is, this thing here is telling me I should start with searching for the data set, hot dog, and import it into my um, project, and I also need to enable Python 3.6. So let's do those two things. I'll start by enabling Python 3.6. So now I'm inside the new project I created, TFR, and we go to Python, and now you can see this didn't appear when you ran the tour, because when you ran the tour, it automatically enabled Python 2.7. But you can see that you can choose here to activate Python 2.7 or 3.6. If you have a ready-made environment, an Anaconda environment as a YAML file, you can just use that and import it, and then that will set up your Anaconda environment with the libraries that you need. But I'm going to enable 3.6. And when you click on it, it, you can see that it brings you to a new screen, and you have to wait for this bar to disappear. Now, we have a relatively a much larger cluster than this with like you know 36 nodes, so it can take you know a minute or two for for that environment to be created on all the all the hosts. The way it actually works is that we have a base environment that we clone on the hosts, so Anaconda allows you to clone them. And you can see here that we have a Conda channel. So defaults is quite a well-known channel, but you also have something called Conda Forge. Um, if you're familiar with Python, um, you, you will probably know about Conda Forge. But you can search in here for libraries. I'm going to search for a couple. We'll go back to defaults here, um, because I need a couple in here. So if we go back to our instructions, it will tell me that I need matplotlib, pillow, and numpy. So you can see it's still not completed, so it takes about a minute. We'll, we'll let that continue going. So what I'm going to do while, while that environment is being created is I'm going to take the next step, which says find your hot dog data set and import it into the project. So if you go up here and type in hot dog, we can make a mistake and just go like that, hot dog. And we can see that there's lots of things. So a lot of people have created projects called hot dog here. And then we have something called public data set and cluster hot dog. So if you click on that, you can see that this is the hot dog data set, and there's a bit of information about it. And here's some good links. There's a, a full standalone app if you want to look up that later. There's a Kaggle competition with hot dog or not, and there's a PyTorch, PyTorch notebook as well for it. So what I'm going to do is if I press this button up here, it's going to say, add this to one of your projects. So I'm going to add it to this new TF or project that I created. And I select my project, and now I press add data set. So it doesn't copy the data set. So if you're working in a kind of a, you know, a big enterprise environment and you want to move data between projects as such, you often end up copying the data. In this case, it's not. It's linking the data in. So if I go into my project and click on data sets, you can see that it appears in here as data sets colon colon hot dog. And the owner may not be you. It may be someone else. In this case, it is me. And if you want, you can go in and look at the data. And we can click on this one hot dog here, and I can just pick some random image here and preview it. And it kind of looks like a hot dog. It's hard to tell. Um, I think it might be a bit warped in the, in the aspect ratio. But you can have a look through your images there. And I'm going to go back and check if Python is 
finished, it has. And now I'm going to install the libraries that I'm supposed to install. So I'm going to take matplotlib first. I just take the latest version. You can pick any version you want. Um, but it should be a compatible one. So I need to install matplotlib, pillow, and numpy. So let's do it. Uh, I think numpy is already installed, but I can do it again, just to be sure, to be sure, to be sure. So you can pick your version here, and then you just go install. And if you want to watch, you can see that they're ongoing here. Uh, there is a button, retry failed up. So if you've used pip in particular, we, when we first started with this scheme, we, I, I taught this in a course uh, at the university, KDH in Stockholm, with 130 students. And I gave them Conda. Right? And I said, there you go, here's Conda. You've got Conda Forge, you have Conda Defaults. And immediately it was like heckles of, well, I want this library. OpenAI is not in Conda. This is not there. So you have a lot more libraries available in PIP than you do in Conda. But the problem with PIP is that it's a bit of a jungle. So you can install one library in PIP, it will pull in one dependency and then install another library. And the dependency may conflict with another library and problems can arise. Conda is much better um, curated as a... As a yeah. So let's have a look. Okay, so I was going to install the last one, which was uh, Pillow. So Pillow is a, a library for manipulating images. In this case, we need to decode the images. We're going to read JPEGs in, and we want to decode them and store them in TF records. Okay. So that's my environment set up. It's, I just need to wait for that one to finish. But while we're waiting for it to finish, we can go back and see what I'm supposed to do next. Um, I have to upload the, the, uh, the notebook, yes. So let's do that. So we can go to data sets here. And, and I'm going to upload it in directly into Jupyter. Because when you open up Jupyter, this is, uh, it shows this as your base folder. Now, you can navigate around. But I'm just going to upload it directly here. Um, it was this one. And you can see it's pretty quick. So now I can start Jupyter. And we can have a look. To what do I want to do? I'm going to click on TensorFlow. And that looks OK to me. We start up Jupyter again. OK, so now I can open my hot dog. Um, Notebook is quite big. And again, this is Magnus Peterson, who did the original version. And he has very entertaining videos, if you want to look them up on YouTube. So what I'm going to do is this is what you end up doing in, in, um, in Python notebooks, if you're not familiar with them. You end up just executing each paragraph one at a time. I just want to make sure that everything is installed. And you can see that Pillow is still ongoing. So when, if I get to Pillow before it's installed, maybe we'll have an issue. but. Um, it's still ongoing. Let's go. So we're gonna, this one is going to use matplotlib, which we have imported already. It should be OK. Again, this is, a, this is not a PySpark uh, notebook. This is just a Python notebook. Some of them are PySpark and some are Python. Typically, PySpark is when we want to do distributed things. This is not distributed, but you could make it distributed if you wanted to. Uh, we're using Tensor 1.8, which is the latest version for this month until another few weeks pass, and then we'll have 1.9. And I'll just explain this code here at the beginning. So all we did at the beginning was we imported some libraries. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to read the data set from HDFS, and it's into this data deer here. And then we have a training directory and a test directory. They're sub-subdirectories of the data directory. So you can see that the path given here is HDFS colon colon projects data sets plus hot dog. So I could just change this to look like this, and um, that would be correct, maybe slightly. So where did I get this path from? Well, this is the shared data set I imported. And if I go back here, we can go to our data sets. And you can see this particular, if I take the test, for example, you can see the path is written up here to that particular folder. So I can just copy it to my clipboard, paste it in here, and then I get that path, because this is a shared directory. If you have um, data sets inside your project, you can use a relative path, which is hdfs.get underscore project path, which will give the relative directory to your project. But this data set is not in my project. I'm, I'm linking it in from an, another project called data sets. So I need to just give the full path to it. 
Okay, so th what this is going to do basically is define some variables. It, it doesn't execute much code. There's going to be two classes of image, hot dog and not hot dog. And um, then what we're going to do is um, just look at what's in the directory just to make sure it's okay. It's using PyDoop to do it. I and mean, it, it looks a bit messy, but you can see that yeah, those folders are in there. That's correct. And then the next thing we need to do is we're getting into data science here now. So I'm going to... I'm not going to go into huge detail on this, but if you have questions, just shout at me and, and we'll kind of say, okay, what's going on here? So this, one, this particular paragraph is quite long. It's defining a class called datasets, and datasets has some paths. It will give you out the path to your files, your training data, your test data. Um, and in fact, what you might expect at this point is you might say, well, my training data is all the images. You know, I want to make a data set with all the images. But this is actually going to make the training data will be the file names for the images, not the actual images. We're going to just set up a data set containing all of the file names. And the first part will basically get our, we'll have something called one-hot encoding. Um, our labels will be one-hot encoded. We'll basically say whether an image is, is a hot dog or not. So you'll have a one when it's a hot dog, zero if it's not, and uh, vice versa if it's, if, uh, if it's the case. So now we've defined that data set object, we point it to our images. And you can see it prints out basically the, some of the directories there. And now we can get the class names inside that data set. So we've got hot dog, not hot dog, and our data set has all these file names. And we can just have a look at that to basically print out the first file name. So this is going to print out the training path for the first image, and that's this one here. You can look it up in the, in the UI if you want to. It's this one. Let's, we, can, we can do it briefly if we have a quick look. It's that one there, and if I go back to here, we can just, can we see um, which folder was it in? It's in the training data, was it? Um, it's in the hot dog folder, okay. It's in here. So this is the image that, that it's just going to show, and it kind of looks like that. So. If we keep going down, we can see that we can get, this is, if you're not familiar with Python, this next syntax here, a method, this method get test set for the data set object, it can return um, basically a, 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 a list with three, three elements. So we can then assign them in a single statement. So we can get, it'll return back the image paths, test the, the, the class labels for them, the classes for them, and then the labels for those, those files. And we can look at the first file, it's that one. And the data set itself has 998 um, images. I found some other ones. You can go look in the net. You can probably augment this data set. It's not a, it's not a big one. And we'll see later on the result of that. It's not big. Um, the next paragraph is basically going to just uh, be a paragraph to plot images with, um, so we, we can view them later on. And it uses matplotlib, I believe. It does, and uh, then we have a method, a helper method, to help us load some image paths um, into, uh, we're going to use this IM path, uh, IM read path, to read in the images. So, so let's plot a few images to see if they're correct. Um, it's running here. You can change these numbers here if you want to plot a few different ones. Did I run them? Okay. Let's, I've maybe hopped over a couple of these. Let's run them again. Right, I'm going to start from this beginning. I'll clear the output. All right, I'm just going to jump back to where we were before. Okay, so we're plotting images, lo defining loading images, and I will plot a few images here. Okay, so if you want to just try check a few different images just to convince yourself that this is actually doing it, we can do it like that. And then we get a bunch of different images. Okay, so n now we have some basic code to, to read up the, the file names for all the images. We want to turn them into TensorFlow records. And we ha we're defining a path that we're going to store them in. It's called resources trained.tf records. 
and um, we're going to store the, the test TF records in, in the same folder, or in this data deer um, folder. So that's our data deer. The, we can look at the data deer here. It's in, it's in here. It's called resources. It's this one here. So we can see there's no TF records there. And what we'll do is um, we'll define some functions to print progress as we're generating them. And this is where we get into TensorFlow code. It's very messy. So if you're using the TF record uh, file format and data frames, you have to define each feature. You can see this is our feature. And we have to take the value and wrap it inside an int64 list. And that's itself an in, uh, wrapped inside a feature. So you have multiple layers of nesting there, which is not easy for understandability. So what this code is going to do is going to decode the images. You can see it says from pill import image. And at some point here, um, let's have a look. In IM read, we're going to decode the image. So that's going to take a compressed JPEG and turn it into a bigger uh, expanded uh, array. So let's run that code, because it takes a few seconds to run. Oh, we're getting an error. Path train records not defined. OK. I must have skipped over that. OK. I think this one here. OK, so I, I skipped over one of the um, paragraphs. So we can see what it's doing is it's now reading all the files. It's converting them into TensorFlow records. It's, it's doing this on the local file system, because PIL doesn't support HDFS, which is a bit messy. And then it copies the results back into HDFS, so we'll have them available in our, in our UI. So we can go into our UI and actually just make sure that the file is appearing there. So that one's finished. We can start converting the next one, the test data. You can see it's kicking off. So if we refresh here, we can see that our training records appeared in here. And if you look at the size of it, it's 57 megabytes. So that's a little bit bigger than the, the training data set, which was, I think, 16 or 20 megabytes. So when we decoded the images and, and expanded them, they became a bit bigger. So now we're, we're, we're converting our training data. And that's nearly done. Done. And now what we want to do is, is we, we're going to use the estimator framework in, in TensorFlow. This is what Google uses internally, and this is being used in production in a lot of places. The estimator framework is a way of trying to abstract out training so that you just basically say, here's the training data inside a, a data set in the data API in TensorFlow. Here's my test data. Here's my evaluator function. Um, here's a function to give you the records one at a time. Here's a, a function to parse the records before you, 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 you feed them into TensorFlow. And, um, and you put them all together, and then you can run it as a single abstraction. So I'm going to define some of the functions for our estimator. This one is basically going to decode our raw image data from, from, the, from the TF records examples. It's going to decode those images. It needs to turn the uh, the, the int, the 8-bit the int, into a, into a float 32, because we're going to train in 32-bit you know, floating, floating point numbers. And um, then we have to extract the, the labels and, and, the, and the bytes for the images. So we return them back as a tuple. And then the next thing we do is we define this input function, which allows you to... Um, when you're training, you might want to repeat going through the data set. When you're testing, you don't want to repeat. And then we, we need to pass back an iterator. Or we need to get an iterator to our data set. This is part of the, the data set framework. Um, and with that iterator, we can get out uh, a, an image and label. And in this case, we want a batch of them, not an individual one. And then we have to return them as a dict, which is a little bit messy. So this is, our this is the, the input function, which will take our input file names and return back uh, some records to the, to the estimator. And this is for the test function. So let's do some training. And we're going to do training um, on a pre-canned estimator. So there's, there's some pre-built ones that you don't write yourself. This one is called the, 
a DNN classifier, a deep neural network classifier. I'll just start it running here and then we can, we can see what it looks like. So the kind of unfortunate part of this framework is there's a lot of boilerplate code for each column or each feature. You have to wrap your values, you can see there, in the feature image and feature columns. This is part of the neural network, how it's going to look. It's going to have 512 hidden units in one layer, 256 in the next layer, and 128 in the next layer. And this is the, the, the estimator that we define. We say that here are the feature columns we're training with, the network architecture structure. We're going to use a ReLU activation function, and there's going to be two classes. It's a binary classifier. So once it's, train, it's finished training, and this one is still training, it should finish. It's 200 steps, and we're at, we've already passed step 101, but it takes a little bit of time. Um, then you can, then you can Evaluate. So the, the estimator framework allows you to supply an evaluation function, and we've just it's just been executed now, and we can see what kind of results we'll get out of it. So it takes a few seconds, and we can see we're getting 50%. So this is basically random. This is not what we want. Now you can say, well, why is that? Well, we have a data set of only a thousand images. We can augment it. You can do this is an exercise for home. You can use um, transfer learning to take an, an existing trained model. We could rotate the images and, and deform them to make the data set larger. Probably you'll need on the order of a few tens of thousands of images to get this to work really well. Um, and the best option would be probably to use a pre-trained model and then train on top of it with these. So there is another one down here we can see with um, another estimator that's defined. I'm, uh, this takes a bit longer to run. It's a, a convolutional neural net. That was just a, a feed-forward neural network. And convnets are, are better at uh, doing image classification. And this one I ran earlier, and we can see the result we got was 58%. I'm not going to train it here because it takes a bit more time, which is a bit better. So there's a signal there that if we ran and trained that for a long time and we augmented and rotated our images, that, that we should get at least some better predictions from it. OK, I said I, I promised I'd finish up a little bit early. So um, with that, I'm just going to say that, look, this is the framework. It's open source. It's a European project. Um, we come from the university, but we have a startup. We're trying to push this out there. Uh, if you're interested in doing deep learning, and particularly on large volumes of data with lots of GPUs, uh, come talk to me. And a lot of people have worked on this, and a lot of people are still working on it. And uh, it's a European platform for deep learning with big data called hops. With that, I'll take questions. And I have a hand up over here on the side. Is it possible? So can we upload our data sets to hops, Hadoop, and you know, run our satellite images, for example? Of course. I mean, we have a cluster in Lulio I can give you access okay. to with petabyte of Capacity. And uh, is there a storage limit, like how much data you can upload? We can. We're flexible. Okay. Thank you. Um, with Th that. Thank you. All right. More questions? Anyone? Thanks for sticking here. Cool. Thank we you, Jim. One more oh. quick one. We'll, we'll, okay. take it. we'll take it anyway. It's new. <laughs> So are we going to see PyTorch on Horovod in Hobbs Hadoop soon? Yes, is the answer. OK, looking forward so, to that. Yeah. Thank you. I, I'm, I'm looking forward to a good model server for, for trained PyTorch models. That's the big, big kind of missing picture piece for, for, for PyTorch right now. You know, but, cool. All right. Thank you. OK, thanks.